I'm going to begin by reading the whole chapter of the 19th Psalm. We're starting today and we'll be in this text, verses 7 to 11, for at least next week, maybe beyond. Psalm 19, David writes, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament, or sky, shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night shows knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. It's universal. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. So these first six verses, David is speaking of natural revelation that we all see, the whole world sees, through the magnificence of God's creation, through the power of God's creation. So this is the first half of the psalm, speaking of natural revelation through creation. But now we move into supernatural revelation through God's written word, in verse number 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. And we'll go ahead and stop there. Let's go one more time to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we have entered into your house today with thanksgiving in our hearts as we think about your goodness. And Lord, we try to reflect that in our worship of singing to you today, Lord, just to remember how good you are to us. And Lord, we know that your goodness is supposed to lead us to repentance. So right now, Lord, we come accepting your goodness and submit ourselves to the authority of your holy word that uh, we might, Lord, progress in this thing of holiness that you desire for us. So we pray that you use your word today, Lord, to enlighten us and strengthen us. And Lord, we thank you for each one here today. Uh, this is a very awesome time uh, to sit and to receive from you uh, what you have in, uh, for us in Psalm chapter 19. So I ask for each one here, Lord, that you will reward them uh, for their attendance, for their faith to assemble together on your day, the Lord's Day. I pray that you would reward them, Lord, with understanding and with joy that we can receive from your supernatural revelation from your holy word. In Jesus' name we pray this, amen. amen. Now there is a breakdown in present-day Christianity that is causing Christians to live without the covenant power and blessing of God in their lives. A breakdown in Christianity today and in this breakdown there are a number of Christians who are not realizing what they can have and what I'm talking about is the covenant power and blessing of God upon their life. And this could be true of some of you in attendance here today that you may be um, on the, the wrong side of the consequence here of, of not realizing something that is yours, and that is this power and blessing of being in a covenant with God. But 
The reason I'm so happy you're here today is the, the solution is not difficult to resolve. Um, I would submit to you that what we need to do to get into the good of what I'm talking about, this, this covenant power, uh, what we need is to begin to feel the same way about an overlooked portion of Scripture that David and Jesus felt about it. And this is what we're wanting to do today and in the, in the coming uh, weeks is we're trying to align ourselves and we've read about David's feelings concerning uh, a portion of Scripture in verses 7 through 11 that he, he rejoices in. We've read that and we want to align ourselves with his feelings concerning this overlooked uh, area of Scripture in most Christians' lives. And we talk about David having these feelings about it, but it was the same way for the Lord Jesus. He also did not minimize a portion of Scripture that many Christians in modern-day Christianity are overlooking. So we'll find out all about this in Psalm 19. But I just have to warn you that today is the introductory uh, part of the message, and that means that it can be a little bit deep. So look to the person next to you and make sure they have their thinking cap on. Take a look at them. Do they have their thinking cap on? All right, everybody, uh, James just put Marcella's on. <laughs> You're looking good with that cap, Marcella. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> we all have our thinking caps on. And, and the good news is, is, is if you grasp this stuff, it'll put you in an upper echelon of Christian knowledge in the world today. This is so important that if you grasp this over the next couple weeks, this will have you in an upper percentile of Christian's alive and breathing today concerning the knowledge of the Bible. So how many say this is this is worth it for me to, to delve into this? Okay? I'm all in. Amen. The first thing we want to do is we want to see what is the identity of the scripture in which David is rejoicing. And we can see it in the first sentence of verse number seven or the first clause. David says here, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Now, here's where the breakdown is. David specifically said, the what? Law. The law of the Lord is perfect. But what many Christians do when they hear that word law and realize that so much in the Bible is talked about the Old Testament law and the New Testament and we make this um, demarcation between the two and so a lot of Christians think that the law is just an Old Testament thing and so much of the teaching concerning Psalm 19 tends to gloss over the specificity of what David's words are. And so they say this, they say that David's words are meaning the whole body of Christian truth. Okay? So, because of this misunderstanding today of New Testament and Old Testament, thinking that they're exclusive, a lot of Christians, when they see verse 7, even though David says the law of the Lord um, they, they gloss this over and say uh, it means when David says this to you and me as Christians, the whole body of Christian truth. And this is, this is where I have a quibble. Um, I, I don't think you, you, you should say that. Because when we look at that word law, it comes from the Hebrew word Torah. Where we get our modern identification of the first five books of the Bible as being what? The Torah. the Torah. Correct. 
So in, in Psalms 19, 7 through 11, we have to be honest. David is speaking specifically of the perfect Torah. These verses describe some characteristics and effects of God's revelation to Moses. And Moses gave us the Torah. So, this is the first thing for solving the breakdown in present day Christianity is being real with the fact that David, when he says, the law of the Lord is perfect, he means the law of the Lord, he means the perfect Torah, he means characteristics and effects of God's revelation to Moses, who gave us those books. When we look at these terms that we see here, the law, the testimony, the statutes, the commandments, the fear, the judgments. We see that David is getting these terms directly from the Torah. That was his source. The Torah is also called the Pentateuch. That's another way of describing the first five books of the Bible. Pentateuch comes from the Greek. We break that word down. Penta meaning five, and tukos meaning vessel, container, or book. So Pentateuch is the first five books of the Bible, the revelation that God gave to Moses. And, and this, is, this is what... Um, we are talking about specifically. So um, we're identifying this scripture and seeing that David, living many years after the, the Torah was given, is rejoicing in what that does for him as being a part of God's covenant. He's absolutely rejoicing in these things that come from the Mosaic covenant. So, let's look at these terms up on the screen. Sorry, it was a little, it's a little small because uh, I, I had to try and fit them together. But we see these things and, and they're all basically speaking of the same thing. There's just little different nuances to each one. For instance, law and testimony are really the same, but a little nuance might be law would be instruction, maybe a little emphasis on that, testimony, regulation, statutes, directions, commandments, prescription, fear, reverence, judgment, specification, but it's all basically really parts of a whole that come back to this idea of the Mosaic law, the Mosaic covenant. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, how do we know that uh, these are the things that David, that David is talking about speak specifically of this part of Scripture? Well, all we have to do is go to Deuteronomy chapter 4, and if uh, after we find that reference, if Janine can turn back to the former slide, we can see that everything that is mentioned in Psalm 19 in these terms, are mentioned in Deuteronomy as Moses is finishing up his ministry of communicating uh, this revelation to the people of God. As he finishes up before he passes away, uh, the last book that he wrote, Deuteronomy, that uh, uh, we see that, that these terms are here, and he's wrapping up his ministry of delivering to the people of God uh, what we have, are calling the Mosaic Covenant. So go to Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 2. And you'll see right here the same terms that David uses in Psalm 19 that we have up on the screen. So after we read um, verse number 2, look up on the screen and see if you can find the same term. 
Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall you diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the what? Amen. Commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. So he's using that term, commandments, that we see right here. Okay? Now let's go to verse number 10. Especially the day that thou stoodest before the Lord thy God in Horeb, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. So we looked in verse number 2, and Moses mentioned the term commandments. We looked in verse number 10, and Moses talks about what? Fear. This fear that is supposed to be passed on to every generation. You're supposed to teach your children this fear. All right? Now let's go to verses 44 and 45. And this is the law which Moses set before the children of Israel. These are the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which Moses spoke unto the children of Israel after they came forth out of Egypt. So we already saw commandments and fear. And in these last two verses we, saw, we see law, testimonies, statutes, and judgments. It's all there, right? And then we turn back to Psalm 19, and we see that everything that Moses talked about in what he gave to the children of Israel as part of a covenant, uh, David is speaking of himself. Roughly 400 years later. Roughly 400 years later. So, in way of introduction, what is David talking about when he's talking about the wonder of God's written revelation? What specifically is he talking about? He's talking about the first five books of the Bible, the Torah or the Pentateuch. Is everybody on board with that now? That is exactly what he's talking about. That is the interpretation. Now we can apply it, like we say, which many Christians do, is that we can take this and, and apply it as meaning the whole body of Christian truth. That's an application. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with, with reading Psalm 19, 7 to 11 and saying, okay, this applies to the whole body of, of Scripture. But that is not an interpretation. That's an application. The interpretation is the, the, the Torah. Which leads us next in so much importance for us to overcome the breakdown that is happening in present day Christianity. We need to understand that in this law is covenant blessing. Why can we not overlook this portion of Scripture? Unfortunately, it is overlooked. But why must we not? It is because David makes it clear that in this Scripture is the reception, as we adhere to it, the reception of covenant blessing. Being in a right relationship with God so that He will make His face shine upon us. Which means this stuff cannot be minimized in the life of any Christian. Now, the thing that, stuff, that jumps out on us that, that makes us see that this is so related to a covenant relationship is how David shifts gears with his, his nomenclature. Um, look at verse 1. We said that verses 1 through 6 is David talking about natural revelation, God showing his power and majesty through his creation. 
Uh, as David starts out, we look, we look up at the sky and see all the stars. He says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Then we look at the sky and see the clouds and, 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 and everything. The, the wind and the firmament shows his handiwork. The sky shows his handiwork. But when he's talking about this kind of revelation, natural revelation, when he's talking about creation, look at the term he uses for deity. The heavens declare the glory of God. So in verse 1, when David speaks of creation, he uses the generic name for God, Elohim. Now, though, we go down to verse number 7 through 11, and David is now talking about supernatural revelation, and now he uses seven times, not God, not the generic identification of God, God, Elohim, but he uses the designation Lord seven times. And we see that it starts with a capital L and then has all capital letters in the O-R-D, which is our key that this Hebrew word for God is Jehovah, which is the anglicized uh, transliteration of the, the more Hebrew uh, way of, of expressing it, and that is Yahweh. So David shifts gears. Why did he do this? Just to be poetical? Not really. Uh, he's trying to get us to see something very important. When he wrote about creation, Elohim. The name speaks of God's great power. But when he wrote about God's word, as I've said seven times, he used the covenant name, Lord, for the God of creation is also the God of personal revelation to his people. So it's the idea that God has for you and me, for our ultimate good, personal revelation to us. We can learn a lot about God and his power by natural revelation. It reveals the reality of God. And that is the Elohim factor, his power. But when it comes to personal relationship, then his personal name, which is what? Lord. Yahweh or Lord. Jehovah. Amen. So, it is the law that brings to the people of God covenant blessing. Many Christians make the wrong assumption that being under the new covenant means every aspect of the old covenant becomes negated and obsolete. And this is the breakdown that I'm trying to address today. So many Christians are uninterested in the information of the first five books of the Bible. And their disinterest is that it doesn't apply to, the, to them. But even worse, it is the idea that, well, because it is the Old Testament law, that, that we don't even need to take it seriously as God's children living in 2024. This would be a grave mistake. Let's go over to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8 and find verses 6 through 11. People want to emphasize the fact that the law is the old covenant. Oh, really? Hebrews chapter 8 is going to give a commentary on Jeremiah chapter 31, which introduces the new covenant. But the thing we're going to see is there's a term that is found in the Old Covenant that is also found in the New Covenant. And you see if you can see what it is. Um, Hebrews chapter 8, 
verses uh, 6 through 11. But now he had obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator, speaking of Jesus, of a what? Better covenant. So covenant is still in play, which is, was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second or the new covenant. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, said the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, said the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord, I will put what? My laws. My laws. Did God do away with the law in the Old Covenant? No. He puts the laws into their mind and writes them into their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. But it all centers on that very important word, law. So I want you to hear some commentary from a few experts concerning this. And I want you to understand that... The law is still so important, and we have misunderstood the new covenant if we think that the new covenant does not include everything that, in a moral sense, Moses established in the first five books of the Bible. If, if we are to negate that or, or think that it's obsolete, we don't understand the new covenant. The new covenant is still talking about God's law. So here's some expert analysis of this. There's no contradiction. Listen. Under the new covenant, in its relation to the old, there is nowhere an absolutely new beginning. That's not what is meant by new, but always a completion only. The Old Testament is the start of God giving the law. The New Testament is the completion of Him giving the law. And the completion of the law is God now gives us a new nature on the inside that makes us, should make us in agreement with that law. See, the Old Testament had a fault because the people could not keep it. They did not have the nature to keep it. So that is the Old Testament, the law given and the people failing in that covenant, just as it says in Hebrews. The new covenant is where God now makes it possible for us to be in agreement and to live in the covenant power of his law. So again, um, what experts say concerning this that most Christians totally miss. Listen to this under the new covenant in its relation to the old. There is nowhere an absolutely new beginning. But always a completion only. Listen to this. The law is the same. The relation only is different in which God places it to man places it into man so if we're understanding correctly the law is the expression of God's nature it is only by the law being written in the heart that man can become a partaker of God's nature that his name can be sanctified in him so the new covenant is the law working inside of us and God never takes the law away because 
The law is the expression of his nature. So, where do Christians get all mixed up on this? Hebrews chapter 8 makes it clear that God has not gotten rid of the moral aspect of the law, the holiness aspect of the law. Where do Christians get mixed up concerning all of this? Well, they get mixed up in the fact that back when Moses was leading Israel, they were set up to be a theocracy. And so in the whole aspect of the law, there were three parts of the law. There was the civil part of the law for ancient Israel as a theocracy. There was the ceremonial part of the law for ancient Israel as a theocracy and the forerunner of Christ. But then there was the moral law. Now the civil law, again, was set up for them to survive in a very hostile environment of a tribal society. And so in the civil law of Moses, there was mandated things like corporeal... How come I can't say that word? I lost two hours of sleep this weekend. <laughs> Corpor corporal. corporal. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, in the civil law, there was mandated corporal punishment. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, right? Uh, the one who kills shall be killed. And so that was part of the civil law. We, society, we as Christians, were not beholden to that part of an ancient the theocracy. Um, we don't have to have corporal punishment uh, necessarily. Um, there was in the civil law year of jubilee, where in the 50th year, all the original land was returned to its original owners and things of this nature. That was part of the civil law needed to survive in ancient times in the Holy Land. The civil law does not transfer over to us necessarily, although we would say that many of their civil laws should be ours, and it could take care of a lot of problems with crime, couldn't it? How many, know what, how many know what I'm talking about? So we don't necessarily throw out the civil law, civil law of Moses, but it's not mandated. There's also the ceremonial law. Ceremonial law of Moses said that if you had a baby boy, he would have to be circumcised on what day? Eighth day. Eighth day. Okay? We don't necessarily have to abide by that aspect of the Mosaic law that we have to, on the eighth day, circumcise male babies. Also in the ceremonial law, there was animal sacrifices that took place every day. Obviously, we do, don't do that. Their tabernacle that was set up, and later on the temple doesn't even exist. So God has shown us in an object lesson that he's not necessarily interested in that part of the law being upheld. And so in the New Testament, when it talks about the law not being applicable to Christianity, it's talking about the civil and the ceremonial. But the moral aspect of the law, the Ten Commandments, and all of the morality of the law, that very much is part of we as the people of God being able to have His covenant blessing upon us, meaning His face shining upon us, and doing for us what only God can do for a civil society. Amen? Amen? So we have to, if we're going to overcome this breakdown in present day Christianity, we have to start feeling the same way about the first five books of the Bible and the information in it as David did, as the Lord Jesus did, and we, we have to understand that, that so much in there is very much applicable to us and necessary for us. And that that, that will, will solve a lot of the problems that we're facing uh, in our society today is getting back to the moral aspect of the Mosaic Covenant. So... Not only in this law is 
covenant blessing, but in this law is very, very importantly, the establishment of the gospel. And this is our last point for today. Until Christians know the first five books of Moses, the gospel loses its teeth. It's by knowing the first five books of Moses that the gospel really takes on its full significance in our hearts and our minds. Amen. Until we really, really know and take seriously, like David, those first five books, there will be an impotency in the understanding of the gospel that has killed our younger generation. Because they've been denied the law, they are very, very cavalier about the gospel because, again, the gospel does not have teeth until we know the Pentateuch. And like I say, uh, today's message is kind of wonky, but it's an introduction and it's something that must be said. So, what do I mean about the Pentateuch giving the gospel its teeth? Well, the first five books of the Bible are foundational and formative. It is by them that we begin to be introduced in a very dramatic, dramatic way to the reality of a suffering Messiah. Amen. And we cannot appreciate it fully until we make these books a part of us. For instance, on the day of Jesus' resurrection, when he appeared to the disciples, it says, He said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. So the law of Moses directs us to whom? Jesus Christ. Imagine Jesus saying that. What's the first thing Jesus says to the disciples when they see him risen from the dead? Oh, remember the law? The, the written law of Moses? That's what this is all about. So what is in the Pentateuch that spoke of Jesus? Well, in Exodus there's the Passover, right? The blood of the lamb over the lintels of the home, the slain lamb, the Passover lamb. Then in the book of Leviticus and Numbers, there's the tabernacle and the sacrificial system. And in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses reiterates all of that so everybody understands. And these things, Passover, uh, the tabernacle and all that it symbolizes, the sacrificial system and the shedding of blood, all of that speaks of the suffering Messiah that every person must accept and receive to get to heaven. Amen? And it, it, it sets it up so poignantly for us that in the New Testament, when we see Jesus, we can look back and see him in the first five books of the Bible, and it just solidifies everything again in a supernatural way because this is supernatural revelation. It affects us supernaturally. For instance, Leviticus 17.11 says this, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. All right, so this is the Torah. This is the Pentateuch. The life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. So atonement for our souls is absolutely linked to what? Blood. For it is the blood that makes an atonement for the soul. 
All right? Everybody says, that's Old Testament. What does the New Testament say? Hebrews 9.22 speaks of Leviticus being absolutely applicable to you and me. It says, and almost all things are by the law, purged with blood, and without shedding of blood, there is no, what? Remission. No remission, no forgiveness. Now last Friday, Andrew and Pam and I, we were Friday afternoon in a public school classroom teaching about, teaching about 15 middle school students, teaching them the Bible. And I was responsible for the memory verse. And I finished up teaching them a memory verse, which happened to be Psalms 1, 1 to, verses 1 through 2. But I told those kids as they looked at me in this public school, I said, you can spend your whole life trying to do what is right, but it will never be enough without forget the forgiveness and righteousness of Jesus. Amen. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Hebrews 9.22. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. So even kids, as I, I said to them, even if you spent your whole life, your whole life trying to do what is right, that would never get you forgiveness. That would never make you right with God. It would not be enough. It's never enough without the forgiveness and righteousness of Jesus. Then I had one of the students come up in front of all the other students and I turned her to Ephesians chapter 1 and I had her read this verse two times to the kids so they would fully understand it. It is this, in whom we have redemption through his blood, through his blood, the what? The forgiveness, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So really we see again the relationship between the old and the new is only a continuation to the point of completion. The completion of the law becoming a part of our nature, the completion of the sacrifice being fulfilled in God's Son on the cross. And we really, really need to get back to David's appreciation for these first five books of the Bible, otherwise there will continue to be this breakdown. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Let's go back to Psalm 19. And find verse number 11. Verse 11, moreover, by them, the statutes, the commandments, the testimony, the judgments, all of these things, the fear, the fear, the fear, moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and here's the covenant benefit, and in keeping of them there is what? Great reward. I have to tell you today that what I am today is not just because of what I read in the New Testament. What I am today is because of what I read in the Torah. What I am today is just as much linked to the Torah as to the New Testament because the Torah produced in me this fear, this reverence for God. Now the reason we're talking about this is I think you all know 
We're seeing an epidemic right now. Everywhere I go as a pastor, people are telling me this. There's a whole generation of young people who have grown up in Christian homes, in homes that they always went to church. So we're talking about church young people. And many of them, a majority of them, as soon as they get old enough to leave home, are walking away from the Christian faith and walking away from the church. How many have heard about this epidemic? It's so bad. There's one lady on our team in our club who is, her husband's a pastor. And all three of her kids are grown-ups now and out of church and are not clinging to the faith of Jesus Christ. This is a home of a, a pastor. O for three with the children. O for three. Heartbreaking, right? How in the world could this be? Young people are walking away from the faith of Jesus Christ and from the church to pursue perverse lifestyles. Now, what is behind that decision? What is behind the decision Part of the problem is they have never become convinced of the truth of the Torah. If they were, these perverse lifestyles would not be pursued. But we shouldn't be completely surprised by this because remember what Paul warned in 2 Timothy chapter 3. He said, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. And he said, men shall be among the other things he lists, in verse number 4, he says, Men shall be heady and high-minded. High-minded means very prideful. They don't care what God says. But the other word, heady, means to be reckless and rash. And we see a whole society endorsing perverse behavior. And it is nothing but absolute recklessness they have no idea of how they are fast-tracking our young people to an early grave. An early grave by suicide, an early grave by disease. They have no idea. All these people in their headiness and their recklessness, they are leading our young generation to certain premature death. Not to mention all the damage spiritually some of them may never recover so the reason the young generation is so heady and high-minded is because we have raised them in a environment of zero consequences and so they can be rash because they never experienced consequences so they think that they can do whatever they want to do with impunity because it's always been that way, but the law of God would tell them otherwise. The law of God shows severity. severity. The law of God shows justice. The law of God shows that if you kick at the natural law of physicality, you will die, and it's all there. And so, the answers to this crisis and, dilemma, crisis and dilemma are very hard to come by. But I would say that, and the reason we're talking about this is some of the answer is to get people back to David's mentality concerning the Torah. It worked for me. It worked for my wife. It gave teeth to the gospel. It gave fear concerning God. And so this is, this is something that we would offer as an answer. And I'm going to have Andrew come up as we wrap up today. Please stand with me, but turn to Psalm 119. God's Word is incredible. In Psalm 19, we have the short version concerning the law of the Lord. But in Psalm 119, we have the long version concerning the importance of the law of the Lord, the Torah. It's so important that God has made the longest chapter in the Bible 
about the first five books of Moses. How many know how many verses are in Psalm 119? What is it, like 176? Is there 176 verses in Psalm 119? If this isn't all you need to know about the importance of the Torah, God has made the longest chapter in the Bible about it. And we're going to do a little responsive reading just to get us ready for next week. We're going to read the first 16 verses. I'll read verse 1, you and Andrew, verse 2. But this will set the tone for going forward uh, with our messages. And the rest of the way, this is the introduction, the rest of the way will be much more practical. But uh, we had to start here. Um, but let's go ahead and get an idea of what we're headed for in the next week or so. So you follow Andrew, read verses 2 and 4 and so forth and so on as I read the even, the odd number of verses. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity, they walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. I will praise thee with uprightness of heart when I shall have learned thy righteous judgments. I will keep thy statutes. Oh, forsake me not utterly. Listen to this. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy Torah. With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Blessed art thou, O Lord. Teach me thy statutes. With my lips have I declared all the judgments of thy mouth. I have rejoiced in the way of thy testimonies as much as in all riches. I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. Thank you, Brother Andrew. And we see all of those words, law, testimony, statutes, commandments, all of that. So you may want to take on a reading assignment as we get ready for next week. Go ahead and, and read Psalm 119. It will blow your mind as you read it along with Psalm 19. All right. Well, let's go ahead and... Uh, have a word of prayer, and then we'll be dismissed with a song, and we'll go to our Bible study. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that your word has answers. We thank you that your word has power. power. And we are so broken hearted, Lord, over this young generation. And we really don't know what to do, Lord, but we thank you that when we look in your word, we see that we do have one answer, and that answer is what you do for us in those first five books uh, to link us, Lord, to your nature. The expression of your nature is in the Pentateuch, in the Torah. And Lord, we are so grateful that uh, as we learn your nature, there is power in that that turns us, Lord, that converts us to you and your way. So, Lord, as a church, we want to be in that upper echelon. We do not want to be guilty of uh, really ignorance concerning the importance of your law in the Christian church, Lord. So thank you that we have this opportunity to delve into this. And we know, Lord, because it is your word, you are going to do something for us. You are going to transform us as the body of Christ as we get back to a basic that is badly over, overlooked in present day Christianity and really has resulted in there being a breakdown 
that is causing us to lose a whole generation. So we praise you, Lord, that you are our shepherd. We've sang about that today. You are our shepherd, and you are leading us in the paths of righteousness for your name's sake, and we praise you for that. Again, thank you for each person here. Thank you for your dil their diligence in your word. Reward them lavishly for honoring your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.